Hello and welcome to the GIS 311 lecture in preparation for Lab 7. This lecture will nearly eliminate any need for lecture in the classroom. It will get us, as you see on the schedule or tentative plan below, that we will have office hours from 2 to 3. That will be in Pinkerton in one of the classrooms, 3, 130, 131, or 308 upstairs. 3 to 4 will be lab help if necessary. 4 to 4.15 I'll be setting up and that's also my mini break before the long evening. 4.15 to 4.30 announcements. 4.30 will be the lab 6 bonus maps. 4.45 will be last minute questions for lab 7 and usually there are none but if there are any we'll have them. And then about a half an hour for quiz 7. That will be mostly on your own, but I will be there to assist, as will some TAs. And then the tentative plan is to have 5.30, 5.15 to 5.30 or so until 9. You'll have time to work on Lab 7. This will be the most lab-oriented class of the quarter. Let's move on to Map of the Day. This is a map of areas where alcohol is not banned, areas, counties where it's partially dry, there are some alcohol controls, very dry or strict alcohol controls, and no data. I found this map interesting because I had no idea of the way the controls worked in many of these states. Having lived in the Northeast for most of my life, I knew about New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, Connecticut, but they were all pretty much the same with the exception of Pennsylvania. Moving on to a different map of the day, but similar. This map doesn't have a title and it doesn't give us a lot of information, so it's an example of a bad map, as a matter of fact. There's no need for North Arrow. There's no need for a scale bar. That's not the problem, but the title is missing and then a subtitle where the data came from, the projection, perhaps. But the information about the map. Consumption not prohibited, so we'll assume that it's alcohol. Family exceptions, and we need to guess what that means. Does it mean that you can drink in the home? I'm guessing that's what it means. Location exceptions. In Hawaii, I've been there. I haven't noticed any location exceptions. And New Jersey, I've been through it. And Nebraska, I've been through it. But I don't know what the location exceptions are. Both type of exceptions, I would guess that that's family and location. But that should be spelled out better by this map. Exception for both together, I don't understand what that is. Perhaps in the home and family. And then neither type of exception. But exception of what? So we have two different alcohol maps that aren't very clear. And neither have a title or a subtitle. But that's some something to think on as we move into designing maps in Lab 7. The basic map design process. Very basic. You'll de determine the objectives of the map, decide on the data layers to be included, plan your, lay your layout, choose colors and symbols, create the map, all the while remember that adding everything possible is not the best course of action. And why is that so important? Well, because if you do add everything that's possible, this is what you'll end up with. It doesn't resemble anything. It may be a nice piece of art, but it definitely isn't a valuable map or product. Questions to consider. This is review from chapters 2, 3, and 4. Who will be using the map? Under what circumstances will the map be used? Is the map likely to be copied or faxed? What objectives should the map achieve? And how sensitive is the map information? There's many more that could be listed here, but these are some of the general questions. 
Choosing layers. Which layers are important and how can you ensure legibility? The point they're trying to make here is we have a map. It looks like these are watersheds and they actually could be Washington watersheds. I'm not sure. Not positive. But the under layer, the raster layer, is making it very difficult to see the data. So choose your layers carefully and also layer your layers carefully as you include them in the map. Some ba basic planning of the layout. If your map is vertical, use a vertical map. 8.5 by 11, but a portrait style. If your map is horizontal or um, landscape style, use a landscape. And also notice in this map, this could be a lot bigger. There's, this is too much white space. It's a, this is a bad example of a, they say it's a better design, but it should be much bigger. We could make a lot of this a lot bigger. But this definitely shows that a poor design for this shape of object is the portrait. Basic principles for balance. Maximize the size of map relative to titles, legends, etc. Distribute the elements evenly on the page and avoid excessive blank or cluttered areas. Align straight edges and use neat lines to enclose map elements. And neat lines are items that wrap around the entire map usually. And all of this information of course is coming from Mary Beth Price, the textbook edition 5. More map layout balance. This is coming from a different textbook which is why I threw it in here. There are two different maps shown on this slide. One is symmetrical and one is asymmetrical. It should be easy for you to choose which is which. The one on the left is symmetrical. Everything is lined up and even. The one on the right is asymmetrical. And I'm going to ask you the question, which of the items below conveys what? What does, and for example, what does symmetrical versus asymmetrical show? I have my own opinions, but it you should also be forming your opinions about what each of these designs tell you about the map or express to you. Neither of these is wrong. They are both okay in their own right. There's many things that we would do differently, but you'll either have a like or dislike for one of them, and that's something that will influence your map design. Things to consider about the map. Are you trying to emphasize tradition? Are you trying to be conservative or simplistic? Do you want to show that you're very rule following? Is your map for something modern? And should your map reflect a modern look? Should it reflect a progressive look? A complex look? Creative look? We saw a couple north arrows that were very creative. Perhaps ideal for a kid's map, but not necessarily ideal for a professional map. What others can you think of from your reading that should affect your map design? We will go over this a lot more in detail in future classes, 312, 412, but now is the time to start formulating your ideas based on the readings that we've read this quarter. Here's a balance overall. Hopefully the two between the two of these that you like, the map on the right catches your eye more. Of course they're, of course they're hor horrible scans, but you get the point that the legend should not be this huge and definitely shouldn't be up in this general area. This is the center of focus, which is the uh, upper two-thirds area whereas on this map it's way down below, which makes this one much more ideal. And also everything on here is over to the left, and there's a lot of useless white space over here. Map layout components or pieces. A title and subtitle telling us who, what, where, why, and when. 
a legend using symbols and colors. You do not need the word legend or the title quote unquote legend in your legend. We know that it's a legend. A scale bar for the correct map. Make sure you don't insert a scale bar with the locator map highlighted. And there is a video about this to help you, a demo video. Make sure you're using a scale bar when a scale bar is needed. If you're just creating a Corethplex map, there's likely no need for a scale bar. Explanatory text, a text box. There's a video demo for that. That should be on every map. Directional or north arrow, if needed. If, we, if north isn't up, then you definitely need a north arrow. Or if you feel that the map viewer, somebody that would be viewing it, wouldn't understand that north is up, then use a north arrow. Otherwise, it's unnecessary. Sources and credits, that would be a text box. There's a video demo about that. A border and neat lines, sometimes they're necessary to hold map elements together. There's a video about that. A locator map, that helps us realize where the map is focused. Maybe a larger map with a red box around it. There are some don'ts of mapping and there's a theory of mapping. I'm going to be covering a lot of don'ts and a lot of do's and then expressing some of my theories of mapping. But there, there's a, you could have a whole course in cartography, which we're doing with map layout. And unfortunately, there isn't time for that, but you'll get bits and pieces. Here are some more layouts. Hopefully, you'll understand that the map on the right is much more appropriate than the map on the left. And these are from the readings. There are plenty of don't do this and do this in the readings, the supplemental readings that were provided on Canvas and or Catalyst. Map layout focus. Where do we start reading a page? Usually it's top left. And are we in enforcing or highlighting the important areas or least important areas. In this case, I would choose the map on the right to be much more ideal than the map on the left. Visual center. Disregard that page number. It's an old page number. Or it may be the page that this graphic is coming from. Visual center. In this case, the visual center doesn't even focus on the map, and over here it does focus on the map. So of the two, the item on the right is the best map, or showing the best visual center. Sighting lines. The fewer, the better. In the map on the left, there are far too many sight lines for the elements that are on the page. The map on the right is a lot more clear and will be a lot more easily understood. Map layout grid. Here we have a symmetrical versus an asymmetrical grid. The map on the left is a symmetrical grid. Everything lines up. The map on the right is an asymmetrical grid. This is where I design my maps. Not that it's better than the one on the left, but it's just what is more pleasing to my eye. You will have to choose and decide as you move along if you design symmetrically or asymmetrically, or if one map versus another should be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Choosing symbols. Natural earth tones usually look better than strident colors. Use pastels for most of the map and use bold colors sparingly for emphasis. Take advantage of the psychological aspects of different colors and symbols. Red may be hot or danger. Green may be grass or it could be good. Mimic phenomena such as using blue to represent water as opposed to things like red for roads. Make color ramps easy to understand. If you're showing an emphasis of one item, 
or the emphasis of one thing from one range to another, it likely isn't good to use a bunch of different colors. You would use a range of co one single color. Apply emphasis with color, size, and thickness. And these are just the highlights or the components of the chapter. I'm pulling them out here so you can go back and look at them and help make your own decisions when you start creating your maps. Here are some symbol psychology examples from the book. In the top left, where is there less rain? What is that map telling you? We don't know for sure, but what does it tell you? And which towns have more people? How can you tell from this map? What is where? On the right, we see some blue, looks like hospital symbols, and then some red symbols with a flag. To me, that would indicate hospitals and schools. Where is the water? What is the first thing you think of when you look at this map down here on the bottom left? And is this map good or could it be made better? And the bottom right, where is the danger? What initially pops into your head when you see this map? You should realize that these things happen without you even think about it. Improving a map on the top would be the bad, on the bottom, would be better. Use more pastels and natural colors. Use a ramp to indicate increasing population. I guess that's the emphasis of these maps. And emphasize the important information. In the lower map, well first of all the blue of the water makes a lot more sense. And the grid is pushed behind the continents and is a lot lighter. It's there to provide some direction of sorts, but it's not overpowering as it is in the top one. Paying attention to design details. We haven't talked about this yet, but it's likely that you've created these modifications in your maps moving forward. The legend on the left is crowded. There's an unclear name, cities.shape, unclear abbreviations, POP1990. That makes sense to you now because you're used to it, but 1990 population makes more sense. Poor formatting in the numbers versus over here we have nicely formatted numbers. And then there's the spacing around it. We have a nice box around this legend, and in our legends we wouldn't have the word legend, and these items could be even bigger for more emphasis. So use this as a don't and a do. Don't and do. Map layouts. Create hard copy maps. Place titles, legends, scales, and north arrows. Include tables or graphs. And add image or logos. That's the process of creating a nice map. And sometimes the map isn't always the focus of attention. Notice that right now the table has more focus on it because of the hierarchy of items. It's a much more bolder print than the light map behind it. And even this um, bar graph is showing more emphasis than the map itself. Using the layout toolbar. This will be difficult at first to use because you're used to using the other toolbars. But pause on this and try to become familiar with what these items mean. And you will use most of these whenever designing a map in ArcMap. There are other ways to design a map. Usually if you use another method you'll create a very quick layout in ArcMap and then export to something like Adobe Illustrator and then do some much more intensive map editing. But pause here and make sure you know what each of these items are as you create your map. Using the zoom tools there is a different. Use the tools toolbar to adjust the map extent inside the data frame. And notice that there's a difference between this tools bar, this is the tools toolbar, and this is the layout tools bar. You should practice with these two items to get an understanding of what it actually does. 
the layout toolbar adjusts the page inside the ArcMap window. So this is the entire page. Whereas this over here would be the items, I believe, the items in the uh, extent inside the data frame. Play with these toolbars to get accustomed to using them. Steps to the layout. Planning the map, setting up the map page and data frames, adding a legend, scale bar if necessary, titles and text, objects if necessary, neat lines and backgrounds, graphics, and then printing the map. We're going to brush through these items. You'll use insert to insert these items, and that's where you find most of the items on the left in the toolbar or the drop down on the right. Moving right along, are you going to, I mentioned this earlier, are you going to use a certain paper size and are you going to make it landscape or portrait? This map right here is portrait. Perhaps it would be better off with a landscape because of the shape of the item. Data frames. This item up top is a data frame and it's active. Notice the dancing ants around it. This is another data frame. We haven't done this yet in 311 but you will actually have two data frames in this in lab 7 we have a margin showing the margin of the page and then you can also add which doesn't show up here a grid for aligning features so that things line up along a left edge for example these two items likely were used likely were snapped to a grid ways to set up the map you may use a predefined map template when starting the map. Set up the page size, data frames, and other elements yourself, or and switch to another template after the map after the map has been created. There are multiple ways to create them, and there this is that switch right there. Assigning frames. I have actually not used this data frame order, but you may use that. In this case, there are three data frames on one map. And notice how each of them has their own little interesting feature. You can play with this. I threw it in here in case you'd like to use it. It's mapping the data three different ways and using three data frames. This is the page and print setup menu. You'll be using this in lab 7. Portrait or landscape, standard size letter, and then the orientation or landscape of the map page size. So notice there's two places to have this and it's some kind confusing. It's it's more it's easier to learn by doing. So you'll be playing with that in lab 7 and also quiz 7. Scale the map elements proportionally to changes in page size. I I check that most of the time. You'll be able to practice and figure out what works out best for you. Composing data frames or composing frames. In this case, we have a frame and we're setting the bottom left portion of this item and you'll do this in the lab. In this case, this graphic or this data frame is centered or every item we click in here is going to be based on this bottom left point of this item. Notice how this point resembles this point. And you can do it with all these other choices. In this case the X and Y position of this point is 2.4 inches X which would be this way and 3.59 inches Y, which is this way, coming to this point right here. So the X and Y position of this point is 2.4, 3.5. The width, in this case the width is 2.9 inches and the height is 3.69 inches, which tells me that this is incorrect. This data frame property, when they made this graphic, does not match what this item actually is. It looks like the position is right, 
or perhaps they haven't applied yet this, this size to make that change to the paper. Scaling the map. Automatic scaling. When you resize the frame, the map changes a fixed scale, does something else, and a fixed extent does a third. When you have a fixed extent, you may not change any of these. You may move the map. When you shrink it down, notice how the map doesn't change in size. It's fixed. And then on this side, automatic scaling, when you use the plus, what would happen? And again, this is where you just need to practice to learn how to do it, to get a gist of it. Listening and watching won't help very much. Labeling options. We will go over these in future courses. Dynamic labels, you may read about it in Chapter 2 or Chapter 3, graphic text, and then annotation. We will not be covering these in 3.11 because they're a little bit more advanced. Just be aware that if you'd like to practice with them, they are there in Chapters 2 and 3. Dynamic labels. labels. You did this, I believe, in Lab 1, straight out of the book. You can label all of the features some way, or the same way, excuse me, or choose other ways to label. And that information is in the book. Make sure you check that out. Graphic text. These are the different ways that you can add text. This would be a new text. It has the blue highlight around it. This one is a call out, so it looks like a call out. This one is splined text, and you can add new text. This is what I would avoid is the new text because you, it's harder to format. I would always add rectangle text versus new text. And here's where you would add these items. A drop down here will give you new text, splined text, etc. I would choose rectangle text for the most text items. And you can always change things to spline as well. Multiple line labels. This is for a larger text box when you need to type in some information. Most people in their bonuses have been using these. And again, this is rectangle text. Even though you're not you may not have multiple lines, I would always use rectangle text. That's my suggestion. And you just type away. I will be providing a handout that gives you information about text formatting that is very handy to make things bold. It's a list of codes that you use to fix your text. And it and greatly enhances what you write and how it shows up on your map. Look for that. I believe it's text formatting options or some sort of file name like that. I put it together so that you can have it all in one place. The label tool. This is a multiple step or multiple window type option. And again, playing with it will be the best thing. But just for now, some label tool options. It gives you how you can change them easily to certain items. You can scale symbols when a reference scale is set. We'll talk about that in future courses, actually. The label tool is used in data view, but it shows up in layout view. And again, playing with it is the best way. Be sure to go back to the book if you don't remember what you read to help you add these items. The, the information is in there, and this is from Chapter 3. Annotation, again, we'll do that in 3.12 and 4.12, particularly because we'll be doing it in a geodatabase. It provides a precise control of each label, which is a little bit beyond what we're doing here, so we'll tackle that in 3 and 4.12. More, more information, default label scaling, setting a reference scale, why and when, creating annotation, data frame annotation groups, and feature annotation. We'll be doing that later. 
how to add a legend click on the legend tool and it opens the legend wizard which I'm going to detail on the next few slides it won't automatically come out like this but this is a good looking legend the first part you choose the layers by using the arrows to add which layers you'd like to add then you set the title and the font you can either erase the word legend or I'll show you a different way in the demos to get rid of the legend title altogether which is actually the preferred method moving on in the legend you may add a border a background or drop shadow adding gap is where we add space to make the legend look nice so it's not crowded on the border and then rounding if you use rounding in your lab around all of your elements you should use rounding in your legend moving on you set the different types of area you may choose rectangle and then all of these items on the list also choose the size of the patch as you edit it a lot of you have been already using that but this information is back in chapter 3 if you'd like to use it moving on some more in the legend this looks like an example but it's actually an active item in the legend if you click on title and legend items it will highlight this area if you clicked on legend items it will show you the space in here so notice it says spacing between legend and legend items this one must be highlighted because it's showing you this space and you can change that and you this all goes in points and then there is a preview button you can right click a legend to open the properties and modify it at any time but remember that this is the ideal looking legend without the word legend legend styles when you go to choose the legend style you'll see a plethora of different things and this is what it will show it'll show this is an example this is an example and this is an example and here you'll see these but you won't see what the legend will look like so this is showing that there's the legend and the legend and then the label picture with the word that it represents so that's why there's a picture and a the word in this one the legend and then the layer name will show for example geology and then the picture and the word in this one a legend legend layer name layer name and then the heading and the heading of perhaps the field rock unit and then we have the items with the color so this is why you'll see these different options in the legend styles I'm going to sound like a broken record but that's how you play with it and learn it here's what it actually looks like when you click style you'll see all of these options and notice there's a drop down arrow just grab that and move down there is a little preview but it's not always as accurate as we'd like and here it is again layer name heading label description showing you the legend terms managing the styles the table of contents refer back to this slide early and often here we have the label so where that's coming from save this slide it's going to save you some hassle where to make text changes that appear in the legend this will save you a lot of time adding a scale bar if needed there is a plethora of scale bar options notice insert scale bar and then there's even more drilling down into the different parts of the legend you can pretty much adjust every single item of the legend here we show what a subdivision is this is a division division unit if you want that to show or not to remember those titles so that you can set, create your legend the way you want it to look without just going with the default here are some more examples as you zoom out it is showing that the legend changes and here we have the scale 
This has adjust division value. This one is adjust the width. So the width changes as you change, as you zoom out and adjust the number of divisions. It changes from the number that they're showing to a different number that are showing. Adding a north arrow, insert north arrow. This was the very ugly one I said was great for kids. You bring it in and then you can also edit this. You can make minor, minor adjustments. I don't suggest getting into it a lot at this point, but just know that they're there and play with them if you have time. Text and titles. I don't use this. You may use the title, but I enter, I insert, if you remember, rectangle text. I don't use the insert title option, but it's there if you'd like to use it. Inserting pictures. We haven't done this, but this is a possibility. In this case, someone insert picture, chose a picture, and put it in the map. Very nice idea. You may want to consider that as you're creating your maps. Neat lines. There's an example of a neat line pulling everything together. And this is where you add it. Insert neat line. And remember, you must be in the layout view to see the insert neat line option. Background, the border, around elements, inside margins. We'll talk about that in the demos. I don't recall ever inserting any graphics, but this is a way to do it. Pause here so you can remember, so you can learn what these items are in the draw toolbar select elements create shapes the font style and number graphic text tools and colors for fill lines and markers lots of options there when you're printing your map you may wish to print obviously this one is not ready to print because the map is overhanging the size of the page you want it to look something like this play with that we're not really printing this quarter but you may want to print on your own so read through there again this is in chapter 3 export as a picture file export map we've done this and then we've chosen PNG and I've asked you to do your bonuses now in PDFs all of you I think have mastered this skill that's how you do it as a quick reminder from chapter 3. Different intellectual and visual hierarchies. There's figure ground, figure versus the ground image, which it provides visual depth. There are design guides that are available online. You can enhance your visual hierarchies by adding depth to flat maps to help the reader see the point and you can do that with white and black or and or with colors visual differences you can use difference in size difference in color use detail edges layering texture and shape and size to show intellectual and visual hierarchies in your map and a lot of this comes from the alternate readings the extra readings that were provided for this week that is where you'll find a lot of this information in those four readings some other noteworthy notes remember visual center that's important balance don't cluster everything in one quarter corner organize your ele elements on the page using hierarchy make sure important items aren't buried Make your background out of the least important items. Remember the slide that had the grid where that was faded to nearly nothing in the light, light, light gray because it wasn't as important. Highlight the important areas. Use light and dark areas for emphasis. Use transparency, which we discuss in the lectures. Use your readings, chapters one through three, all previous chapters, and the four listed below. One is map layout, one is map symbolization, one is type on maps, and number four is the big picture on design.
use those as a reference. I don't think you'll have enough time to read through all of them cover to cover, but remember to use and keep them as a very good reference to creating good maps. And remember, next quarter in GIS 312, Lab 1 is likely as simple as map your home. This is the end of the lecture for Lab 7. While you won't likely remember every single item that I just presented, you now have the option of referring back to it and also reference of where to find it in the four alternate readings and chapters 1, 2, and 3 of our required textbook. Be sure to read all of those readings so that you're familiar with them. The next step after watching, or excuse me, after watching this video and reading the readings is to watch the associated demo videos. Come to class prepared for quiz 7 because it will be based on this lecture video, the demo videos, all of the readings for this week, which are the four supplemental readings, chapters 1 through 3 especially, and all previous lectures, readings, and videos. If you have any questions, please put them in the discussion area or email me. Another option is to bring them to class, as I would be glad to answer them prior to the quiz. And that wraps up Lecture 7, Lecture 4, Lab 7.